One of the uh, things that emerged from the coal seam gas inquiry was um, we were able to grill all the heads of coal seam gas in uh, Australia. So we had uh, Mr Henderson, who you might know from Metgasco, come and uh, he's had to give sworn evidence because it's an upper house inquiry and I asked him how many coal seam gas wells he would have to have uh, at a minimum. And we were able to draw out of him over, you know, 10 minutes of uh, questioning that he said at least 500. And our estimates, and that's just around Casino and up towards Kyogle, but our estimates are he's going to need, Metgasco is going to need at least 1,500. And one of the strange things about coal seam gas is that there's no regulatory um, control over it. You get, you get approval for exploration and you've in fact got approval for production. There is really no difference between exploration and production. Because in an exploration, they come on your land, they drill the hole, they, they potentially can frack it, they put the wellhead there, they put the tanks, they put the dams there, and then when they're doing production, all they do is hook up the pipes between it all. So it's, it's unlike any other industry that really the damage is done at exploration and that doesn't need anything other than ministerial sign-off through an RF. It's an unregulated industry, we've never seen anything like it and it's just crazy that you could have hundreds of thousands of wells come in with no regula regulation whatsoever. I would just like to point out that in the picture here behind me of the, uh, the lovely looking gas field, that's 70 wells in Queensland, 70. Queensland have plans for over 40,000 wells. So if that doesn't make you feel a bit uh, nervous, then I don't know what does. I've got a question over the side here, thanks. Hi, I was hoping that someone on the panel could just clarify the political jurisdiction here. I, I'm gathering it's a state issue with maybe a federal influence? It's completely controlled by the states. Uh, this is um, this is mining is completely the jurisdiction of state government. Uh, so, but the the difficulty we have in New South Wales is we've never had this industry before. So the act that it's that controls coal seam gas is called the Onshore Petroleum Act, and it was just never designed to deal with coal seam gas. It's an outdated piece of legislation that doesn't deal with it. And then in terms of the regulation, the government doesn't know who is responsible for coal seam gas. Because you've got the, um, you've got the, minister, the minister, you've got Andrew Stoner as uh, industry and investment, facilitating the industry, going out there and spruiking for it. You've got the Department of Primary Industries doing some of the regulation of the water. You've got the Office of Environment and Heritage supposed to be doing some of the environmental monitoring. And you've got the Department of Planning responsible for actually doing the assessment of um, the, uh, the, the, the major proposals. So when I go into Parliament and ask a question about coal seam gas, they all sort of look around and go, uh, who wants to answer this one? And, and ultimately, it's the responsibility of Barry O'Farrell. This, this industry will live or die on his say-so. He has enormous control over his cabinet. And if, when, you're, when you're writing letters to your local member, don't forget to CC Barry O'Farrell. They are watching this like a hawk. They are terrified that this is national, a national party seat, that they are losing that the National Party, um, the, their key constituents on this issue. And, well, where are the local members tonight? If they can't turn up here, I think that's a pretty poor show. But it's, it's Barry O'Farrell who's in charge, um, and they really, it really is a loose show. How does, yeah, something like, say, 10 parts a million pollution in a suburban block compared to the, to the mud um, pollution on farmland, and that's going to be food that we're going to eat, and I would, would imagine it'd be higher than that. The difference is, is this is going to be released into our agricultural land and into our groundwater and into our surface water. 
And of course, once you do that, you have no control over it. It's gone. It, it's there. Um, you can't bring pollution back. Um, I, I will stress it worries me even with the levels within houses uh, about how high our government has set those levels to say it's okay. And, and certainly, I have some real concerns about the about the you know height of levels that, or the the amount that they allow in in uh, um, urban areas. But I think when you come to talking about putting it onto agricultural lands and putting it into rivers, then we have something really to worry about. I can't give you a comparison because the levels that we were picking up in produced water were very, very limited samples. But I can say that they're all above drinking water standards. So, you know, that gives you an idea. And certainly those levels that they're talking about with the uh, land spraying of mud um, in Queensland would not in any way pass um, standards for environmental protection if we looked at um, that sort of, you know, level contain containment. But I'm not sure if that answers your question. I hope it helps. What concerns me is that in Richmond Valley, the situation is quite different because the council has actually invited the industry aboard. So. Uh, we've got a situation there where it's really hard to get a group like this going because of the feeling that the, the horse is bolted. Mm. And I'm here today, and there's a number of us from the Richmond Valley Group, to support what's happening here. And one of the reasons we're here is we need enormous support from people here when something happens over there. That's what's got to happen in Richmond Valley because if it doesn't happen there, it's not going to happen here. And uh, I just want to say that the way this is going to fall is going to depend totally on networks, on networks between little networks like ours. So I just want to get that message out. Thank you. Right, somebody Facebooked me the, this message about a month ago saying that um, all the politicians are getting paid off so that they will tick the box which says, yes, there is CSG in... Um, our area, yeah. From the outside looking in, you'd wonder if that was the case. But the, there is an ideological bent to the coalition government and to elements of the federal Labor government. And they just want to turn Australia into the world's largest quarry. They have only one idea, and that is to get as much coal, as much gas, as much bauxite, as much iron ore out of the country at one time as we can. And exactly, and then what we've seen in the last two weeks is Barry O'Farrell overturn a 26 year moratorium on the mining of uranium. When you talk to these people, like on my coal seed gas inquiry, those people on that inquiry tell me that climate change is crap. They tell me that solar and wind are useless, that make no difference to the, to the economy or to our environment. They don't think that burning coal or, or, or facilitating coal seam gas or having nuclear reactors is any problem whatsoever. Like when people, when I talk to these people, I just I think I've got to I've got to get you sacked. I mean, you can't be in control of my bloody country. But as Wayne said. You've got to focus your attention on them. They read those emails. When you have a, when you have a protest, I saw on YouTube the other day, uh, Thomas George getting a really hard time somewhere up here. And that's exactly what you want. Because they go back down to, to uh, Macquarie Street, they go to Canberra, and they say, oh, I've got a real problem on my hands up in the Northern Rivers. You know, put, help me, help me, Barry. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's actually corruption as in like a brown paper bag, but what we have is a revolving door where you see people who are on the executive of parties move into corporate, um, like, like, we, like, I know this is you know, like at the risk of being lynched, we don't pay our politicians enough. <laughs> We pay, we pay our corporates way too much. So the politicians think what happens is they spend seven years and they think, oh, I've served the people, I've suffered so badly. Now I want a job where I earn $800,000 a month, you know, facilitating coal seam gas. So what happens is they leave politics and they go and work for Eastern Star Gas, for, you know, a coal mining company, for, you know, just another 
uh, big multinational mining company. That's what happens. We, we, we really do need to make sure our politicians are serving us in the long term and not just looking to their superannuation payout working for a mining company. Right. I don't want the pay rise. Politicians are only in these positions because we vote them in. So when you go to vote, think about who it is that you're voting for and what their policies are on important things like coal seam gas. We've got a question down the front here. The only question I've got, because I know there's lots more, I'm a rural contractor, I've been in the industry for 30 years. What I don't understand is that they say the chemicals are not, haven't been assessed. We as chemical users, we have to part of, yes. pass an accreditation course. What I want to know, do the mining company work, workers have to pass that also? And if they're using chemicals that are not registered, they have breached their care of duty, which we have to keep at all times. Thank you. I'm really happy you asked that question because I think there is a lot of confusion about chemicals that are assessed or chemicals that are illegal to use. And you were stating you need to do training. If you're using agriculture and veterinary chemicals, those are assessed and you do need to do training. But unfortunately, the chemicals that are involved in CSG are all industrial chemicals. And we have a completely different system of industrial chemicals. That's uh, run by a group called NICNAS, National Industrial Chemical Notification Assessment Scheme. Great long name, but they are starved of funds. They are, they are fought every fraction of the way by the industry about even having to have any of their industrial chemicals registered. And so unfortunately, we have currently 38,000 industrial chemicals on the Australian Index of Chemical Substances, which is perfectly legal to use if they are on this list, the AICs. But of that 38,000, probably 3,000 have been assessed. Yeah. So we have 35,000 chemicals that are in products that are being used by the mining industry, not only the CSG industry, that have never gone through a regulatory framework ever. And that, that is a national disgrace. And that is something that I suppose I've spent the last 20 years trying to change, as, as many other people in Australia have. I have never seen an issue uh, unite people from all walks of life, like uh, coal, the coal seam gas issue has. Um, I was disturbed before I came here tonight, but uh, will go away um, even more disturbed because of the potential impact on health resources in this area which can't cope with the present uh, impacts of health, let alone an increase that uh, is, has come to our area via coal seam gas. Uh, another point I'd like to make is that for a lot of people who attended here tonight, this is just one step of a big flight of stairs. There's going to be some obstacles in front of you uh, when you go to walk up those flight of stairs and you've got to be prepared to get around those obstacles one way or the other. But it's no good coming to a meeting like this and take the first step unless you're prepared to take the next one, the next one, the next one and the next one. And that's the cold hard uh, fact of the matter. And bear in mind that to win this fight, you've got to show a bit of guts. And that's what's going to win it, guts. You go home and look in the mirror and say, geez, I'm going to let my family down, I'm going to let my grandkids down, I haven't got the guts. Well, don't come back. Thanks, mate. I think I've got a question behind you. The gentleman standing up. Sorry. Okay, I'll follow up with the gentleman oh. beside me. Um, somebody said that it's going to be make or break for the CSG industry in the Northern Rivers. Yeah, I reckon that could well be the case. Another speaker said we should address the political process and write to our politicians. I'm 78. I've seen a lot of politicians. <laughs> and uh, yes, I know democracy is government of the people, by the people, for the people. So they say, but. What I see these days is government of the people by political parties for big corporations. And I'm not at all sure 
that our, I, yeah, I write to politicians and we should all do that, but I'm not at all sure that it's going to work. And when the crunch comes, we're going to need the guts. And now, as an ex-academic, I'm living in Nimbin. And one of the traditions of Nimbin is action. And the World Heritage Rainforest Areas were saved because of action by activists in the Nimbin area. And I reckon when the crunch comes, we may end up with blockades like we saw there with that guy, that farmer that was really speaking passionately. And what we are going to need is the numbers. The numbers so that we just outnumber the police and they won't have a flaming clue as to what to do. So, okay, political action, but direct action as well. To the person who asked about the sealing of the wells, I'm now informed that Medgasco, or Fardgasco, sorry, um, like to use gravel around their wells because it's hard to see the methane bubbling up through gravel. <laughs> Um, in reference to the headlines in the Northern Star this morning about the intimidation of families, intimidation of families is always crossing the line. But fuck Gasco have been intimidating my family. Yes. Yeah. 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 Exactly, mate. Our roads can't handle these truck movements. They just can't do it. And look, this is prime agricultural land, stay off it. We can make any land prime agricultural land. The problem is that the money for the innovation is not there to support the small innovators. It's there to support the big companies like Medgasco, yeah. who have the lobbyists who claim that they can somehow turn this into some economic haven. Thank you, Andrew. As far as the damage from the infrastructure from coal seam gas on our community infrastructure that councils on the whole pay for, that is a great and significant area of need. It would be in Jeremy's, in Orange as well, and it certainly is here for us because we know we've got, in Lismore, our local government area, 1,200 kilometres of roads, uh, high rainfall, as you know, uh, very... Uh, hilly and windy roads, very difficult to maintain, and the Lismore area pug soils on the top of that. You know the condition of our roads, and I would on take this opportunity to drive, tell you to drive home carefully and watch all those potholes, <laughs> but they would be made so much worse with trucks from, and other vehicles from coal seam gas. One of the key things uh, that I've learned um, in my experience in local government, in a mining affected community, and as the mining spokesperson for the Greens, is that there's the damage to the infrastructure that mining companies um, cause, uh, and the, the, the use of um, the material infrastructure in your community, which is the roads, the water, the pipes, the electricity, the easements, all of that. But there's also the damage to your social infrastructure the amenity of your community. And that means that as a community, are you prepared for 1,500 people to come in, and probably more, uh, usually in, not in the middle of a place like Lismore, but you know, in one of the little villages, in a major camp. With them, they, they, they're not members of the community. They're not looking to settle here. They're transient workers. They have certain demands, certain needs. They change the um, nature of your community. That's what happened in my community in Orange. It was it, like from 1997 to now, it is completely different. And you've got to think about like housing. Young families here struggling to get into the housing market or find a rental. All of a sudden, they're competing with miners earning big money, who are only there for a short amount of time, and uh, there's those sorts of issues you get. In, in, and that really does affect the social cohesion in your community. There's the, the miners and the other people, the people who are benefiting from the mining, and those who aren't. And it's just not fair for a company to come in and to establish without the community, the local government, having ownership at the very least. And, 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 it's, and it's even worse when the community is saying, bugger off. <laughs> Fellow up the back talked about, um, talked about blockading and saying that you know, it's one thing to be writing to 
politicians, but what it's going to really come down to in the Northern Rivers is blockading. Yeah. This whole question about blockades, the gas groups uh, are all organising workshops in non-violent civil disobedience. We have speakers, we have trainers, these workshops are happening. Talk to the people who will be organising the Lismore group, find out when the next workshop is. Get yourself up to speed on this, what your legal rights are, what your obligations are. I've been a farmer in Rosebank for 50 years, and back in the 80s, when the government of the day decided they would allow concessional farming lots to be done to take three lots out of their property, there were water bores put down on some of these concessional lots, which have resulted in the water level in the creek on the property I own dropping. Mm. So what I'm saying is, I take this matter, when they say that water levels are dropping, to be very, a very serious matter that I feel a lot of people have got to start thinking about. Yeah. So I am concerned that if this water level drops, there's no guarantee that it will come back to where it was. Yeah, you're absolutely right, mate. I was at the casino well today, and when I approached the um, workers who were there and asked them if they were fracking the well, they laughingly said, what's fracking? I could have quite easily have told them in no uncertain terms about what fracking is. Um, I just want to know that as, a, as an ordinary person who goes along and sees these sorts of things happen, what can I do to make them answer those questions when I put them to them? What can we do as people who, who say, what's going on? What are you doing? You know, why is it that they can get away with lying, you know, blatantly lying to us? without having to any recourse. How can we approach them in some way that they must answer our questions? By being persistent. You know, Woody Allen said that 80% of success is just turning up. And, and that is the key. It will come down to direct action. That's what I meant when I said earlier that the Northern Rivers will be the place, the front line, the litmus test of coal seam gas because you've got a proud history of being um, uh, civil and disobedient. And uh, uh, <laughs> with emphasis on civil there. And, and, but, but going routinely, um, sitting down, saying, no, we are going to blockade you. The number one risk, Grant King from Origin Energy said the number one risk to coal seam gas in Australia and actual fact, potentially globally, was you, was community opposition. They are spending millions on PR. They are doing focus groups. They are going to test all kinds of spin and messaging in the coming weeks and months and years to try and win you over. But it's obvious that you, you, you won't swallow that crap, that you understand what's at risk, and it will come down to uh, civil disobedience, peaceful, non-violent, direct action, um, and that will cost them an arm and a leg, and that's how this debate, this, this campaign will eventually be won. No farmer in Australia has been arrested yet, and the governments are terrified of that image. If you think they're scared of an image of hats being run over, you wait until they see someone like that fellow who was giving that passionate speech being handcuffed and frog marked in the back of a paddy wagon. They will have lost this debate the second they arrest a farmer. That's why the Spring Ridge blockade at, uh, at Liverpool Plains was ended and Santos left because they knew they couldn't lock up someone wearing a Nakubra. Look, people who've come from forest activism like me and, you know, spent a, a time up in tripods and all the rest of it back in the day know that, you know, we've seen people locked up, you know, in the Tasmanian forest and Chilundi and all these places, but we have never seen mass arrests against farmers. That's why it's really important that you talk to your neighbours, that the farmers, they engage with the environmental activists and that if there is going to be civil disobedience, we're all side by side.
guys. Sorry, Simon. I'd like to thank everybody very much again for coming along tonight. This is shows strength in community, and that's where our real power is, and that's why they're scared of us, and that's why they don't like us coming together and sharing information.